Hey, John. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, just um, I, I expect people will trickle in. Um, yeah, I'm going to let Ed do whatever introductions, I guess, need to be done because um, I'm not sure how everything's going to go today. And I suspect he knows. So, Fair enough. Yeah. I'm going to – I don't think my camera's working at the moment. Give me just a moment here. Okay. There we go. Cool. Yeah, Ed wanted to use my account because I have uh, unlimited, so. Yep. I just did my first one of these things two days ago and it was trying to time me out after 40 minutes, so. Oh, oh yeah, it, it will, it will. If you ever have an important meeting where you need unlimited time, shoot me a message. I'll let you use my account if you need it. Okay. So what's uh, what's been going on? Ah, uh, just writing and working on stuff. And, but seems I get more more jobs lined up than I have time to pull off. So, well, just finished editing a finished editing a uh, seventy thousand word book the other day, and then um, well, I've got three more on the board right now. So, hey guys, um, hey, how, how you doing? doing? Doing good. Yeah, Ed, I suspect Ed should be here any minute. Um, Cause I've told him I would let everyone in around 145. Okay, good. Uh, here he is. Hey Ed. Hello. Um, yeah, since since I don't know how this is going to go today, I was just saying like I'm, I'll let you do whatever introductions need to take place. I'm just I'm just here. Okay, Nathan, nice to meet you. Hey Edward, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Doing good. Yeah, so I, I guess your neighbor's with uh, my buddy Levan. <laughs> yeah, Levan, right up here. Yeah, smart, small, small world. Yeah, well, small, small town, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Small town and big world yeah. craziness. Now, and, and again, we, I really appreciate this. It's uh, it's a rare treat. Um, well, I, don't, <laughs> I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> uh, I don't think you will. Um, yeah, for I guess what we're looking at here is, uh, I don't know how much John has already said, but basically um, you're gonna be talking to a bunch of writers and I think a few actors. Um, mm -hmm. I know one of the gentlemen, um, they're actually going to be a movie that they're filming uh, in the Bell area, uh, I guess sometime later this year or early next. Uh, so uh, he's raising cool. funds for that. Which area? Uh, in Bell. Bell area. Yeah. So that's very cool. Rare, rare treat. Um, so I, I guess just uh, maybe a little bit about your background whenever we start, and then uh, we can just bombard you with a bunch of uh, questions that'll make your head spin. Okay, great. I'd rather do that than uh, try to give a talk. Yeah, I, I, I hate, I hate just talking about stuff in general. Like the interaction is always better for me. Yeah, because I get well, I get flustered and my brain kind of trails off. You know, one of those ADHD type. Uh, oh, that's interesting over here. So, so are all of these? Uh, uh, are all the people coming? Are they all uh, Osage? county writers or Missouri writers or Midwest writers? No, um, the gentleman, one of the guys that's going to be joining us is actually from uh, Pennsylvania. I believe is originally from New York. Um, oh. He's been in a couple little things and uh, we just did a uh, reading for the script that's going to be that they're wanting to film out here uh, a few weeks ago. So, uh, and so oh, what's it about? <laughs> it's, hey, John, you want to take that one? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can answer that pretty simply, I guess. Um, yeah, he's he had come up with an idea for a uh, like a mobster werewolf movie. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 as interesting as it sounds. 
Yeah. And uh, love it. And Levi there, he's, uh, I've known him for years. He's one heck of a writer. He pumps out a lot of books each year. And uh, he's hey, Levi. Yeah, always I'm, wants I'm to do slower now than I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I used, used to pump out about three to four books a year. Now I'm doing good to get two a year. So Jesus, how do you do uh, that? This year is a lot different. I'm, uh, well, two years ago, I started taking care of my grandfather. He passed away wow. in October. So I'm trying to get back into the, back into the swing of things but i'm looking at about four to five books this year so wow. what it's do you write been a busy year mostly sword and sorcery fantasy yeah um, do you do any then a, then a couple, dragon uh, stories or anything like that yeah that's my primary style i've done a couple urban fantasies lately but mostly it's sword and sorcery type what's an urban fantasy shadow run uh, uh, modern fantasy uh, imagine uh, miami vice with orcs and elves and magic oh okay <laughs> yeah the, awesome. uh, what's that show with uh will smith on uh netflix now uh bright bright yeah right is that a show now yeah um that's but, it's that was just a movie but yeah and i I saw that they're making the second one, so. Hmm. Well, yeah, I I can't even keep up. Uh, I almost know less about TV now that I work in it than uh, I ever did. Well, I, I'd imagine though that you get like hyper-focused on like whatever project you're working on and everything else just kind of tunes out. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you work, you get paid for 60 hour weeks, but sometimes it's 72 and, you know. It's a lot of work. Yeah, so, um, so are you just like on a mini vacation now or just? I, I forced one. I, I was hopping off of Queen of the South. I got up here from New Orleans last week, got hired on CSI Las Vegas. I, they told me I could be remote for a few weeks. And I was like, okay, great, because I got hemlock in my hay field. I got to pull out, and I got to, <laughs> I got to do this, and I got to, you know, I got to get my backhoe down to my dad's place and grab and help him dig a hole. And my little nephews are coming down next week. They want to go camping. Nice. And then the designer, like Wednesday of last week, was like, hey, you're doing a scout in Los Los Angeles on Tuesday. <laughs> And I said, I can't. I told you I'm three weeks out. <laughs> and he was trying to say, well, just come on out here. <laughs> I said, uh, no. So I went and I got, I replaced myself on that. It's probably, it's unfortunate because he's, I haven't worked with that designer before and it would have been a good job. But honestly, I, it was making me grind my teeth in the middle of the night thinking about having to drive back to LA on, on Friday. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very fortunate position for me to be in, you know, uh, I mean, I'll save it for the talk, but when you start in this business, working back-to-back -back shows is a dream, you know? Oh, yeah. So. Well, like, looking at a lot of the writer stuff, it's like co you're contracted for, you know, 8 to 13 episodes, so, you know, you're kind of locked in for maybe maybe a few months, and then, you know, if you don't get rehired trying to find placement on another show. Um, yeah. I, know, I know that John's worked in, in, in a lot of uh, different projects with the industry, so... Yeah, I pri I've primarily worked in film, not so much in TV, except when I was in Russia, that was TV. Mm. Um, but it's definitely it's definitely a different animal in so many ways. Um, but I've talked. Have we met? Um, I think I think you and I have met briefly. Didn't we meet at uh, uh, McLean's house uh, or uh, at dinner at? Uh... Uh, McLean's house. Yeah, well, that, I, I guess that probably would have been a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I you sound really familiar to me. I thought, gosh, I know this guy. Yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah. So, and then you that would you had already gone to Russia then? Because yeah, I think you told I, I me that. On, I worked as a staff writer on a Russian soap opera that I always yeah. describe sort of like a Russian NYPD blue. <laughs> um. Yeah, Do you but know I, Russian or did they translate it all for you? Um, my, my Russian's pretty good. Okay. It's not bad. So that's one of the primary reasons why they hired, they hired me to begin with. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I, I won't lay claim to knowing as much about television. Um, Ed knows that two of my closer friends are now the currently the co-producers on Umbrella Academy. Yeah. Um, okay. So they're always filling me in on things, but I, I'm sure I have a lot to learn in any case. Yeah. yeah. John's, John's a very humble guy. Um, I mean, not to throw too much out there, but uh, he used to write with uh, uh, Rodney Dangerfield. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one of the first things I did. I spent a lot of time writing with stand up comedians and then I worked with Rodney for about three years. Oh, wow. He didn't have like 30 years of stick behind him. Or was um, he just trying to keep it fresh? Uh, yeah, I did a little bit of that. More of what I was doing, I did a lot of um, hit film projects that would come in, like pitches and proposals, and I worked on uh, more on the development end. Mm. Yeah, so so don't so don't feel like you're going to be talking to a bunch of uh, com people who just have no clue about uh, the industry. I mean, I I know a little bit. Uh, I I'm like dipping my toes in. So I, I, I think nowadays people know way more about it than we used to before I moved out to Los Angeles, because okay. I think it's uh, tweeted and, you know, there's a lot of backstage stuff that goes out on Instagram and uh, Facebook and TikTok and all that stuff. So I feel like the general public's a lot more aware yeah, and that's of how the sausage is made. And what I love about uh, social media, I mean, I, I tend to hate social media just because of a lot of the negativity, but what I do love about it is the access that we get to like the behind the scenes things and celebrities putting up little snippets, uh, you know, either pictures or little videos of what happens. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I'm always like trying to look in the background to see what's going on because I, I know that if it, that's, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be like on camera. I want to be like off camera somewhere, uh, just kind of. Mm -hmm you know, kind of, hey, this is kind of what I want you to do. Not so much directing, but as far as writing. Mm -hmm. so. Hey, Ant. Hey, how are you? Doing good. Thanks so much for inviting me today. I'm glad you can make it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Anthony there, uh, he was supposed to be doing some filming today in up and around what, uh, Pennsylvania? And you got rained out? Um, on Kelly Drive. Uh, we got rained out today. So we rescheduled for Tuesday afternoon. We're gonna, we'll have the sunset behind us uh, with the reshoot. It should actually be better. So. Mm -hmm. I already got some B-roll of the um, of the drive and like, approaching the art museum from behind and stuff so I could fill in between the action. What, what project is this? So this is, uh, it's called New World Ordered, and I have 42 pages scripted. I also have um, my writing partner and scene partner, Mike Hoff. He has another 20 pages scripted. Oh. So it's two stories running linear about two comics trying to survive uh, the pandemic and find love, you know, just like a sitcom. Perfect. Uh, uh, so um, we were filming some scenes. Um, Two weekends ago, some crowd work scenes, and I got some comics from Philly to come out, and then we got some people in the park without paying them or having them sign a waiver, jump in and help us too. So that was cool. <laughs> and we got a cool. Well, uh, Mike had a Joker face on, so people wanted to. It was attracting interest. Uh -huh. So we got we got that uh, big scene done, and now we're trying to. Um, we got rained out again Wednesday. Seems to be raining every day. I want to film, but we did nine pages indoors that day, three different rooms. Wow, uh, well, nine pages is a lot. It was. It was. We were here for five hours, and I fed Mike twice, and he was exhausted at the end of it. <laughs> well, when you start filming in Missouri, uh, I think you're really going to learn to hate the weather. Well, I filmed in Missouri in 2017, and it was like 100 degrees every <laughs> afternoon. If I can that, recall. That, that and when Anthony was in Missouri in 2017, I think we were shooting like 18 pages a day. Mm. It was a fast pace, yeah. <laughs> yeah, initially that shoot I remember was supposed to, um, I what I was told is it was supposed to take like two weeks, but he shot you guys out in like four or five days. Oh, wow. 
That's craziness. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I was like, I didn't think you'd be able to do it. Um, yeah. Pages a day sounds like a uh, uh, an asylum film. Yeah. It's supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I try to do five pages a day. I try to do um, some outside exterior setup stuff and then um, and then I try to like dive into one like four or five page scene. The idea is that it's four, four to five minute snippets on YouTube, but if you watch it, it's the narrative, like a, like a TV show. Uh -huh. okay. All right, I think, I think this might be everybody. Um, hello, hello, Mr. Vaughn, nice to meet you. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, occasionally over here on my shoulder, you'll see one of my dogs playing around on the stairs because he's an idiot and he doesn't understand how bad it hurts when he hits the ground. Right. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to go get my coffee just finished. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah, if, any, if anyone else comes in, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, let them in. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah um, I sent Elaine the link. So. Yeah, uh, she was going to be joining us, right? She said so. Uh, I, I'm going over there later, but we live like 40 minutes apart. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, so Jason, uh, what do you do? What do I do? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, hey, yeah. Jason, it's, it's good to see you. How you doing? Uh, yeah, I work at the IRS now, so, um, and I write in my spare time. So you're the one we need to talk to then, huh? <laughs> um, you know, nobody knows what's going on at the IRS, so I, I don't know anything. I just type in the numbers and uh, don't ask questions. We're probably being watched right now. <laughs> don't know that. I didn't say that. <laughs> But no, I, uh, you know, write in my spare time and Mark told me about this. So I thought I'll just mostly watch and be silent. Huh. Yeah, and I, I thought Mark was going to join us too, but uh, I guess he, he might've got busy on the farm today. It's like all, all my friends around here are busy on their farms today. Yeah. It is March. Yeah, I, I'm so it glad is. I don't hear that anymore. <laughs> And hello, I'm just glad all I have is hey. Hi. It's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's not bad. No, did uh, okay, okay. So um, Nathan, I, I guess if you wanted to kick off, tell us just a little bit about yourself, and then we can jump into it. Uh, yeah, born and raised St. Louis ish, and uh, um, went to art school at SCAD. I, I went to Mizzou first, but I flunked out. And then um, I was back in St. Louis doing private eye work and worked on a little movie up there called, um, it's been so long, Apocalypse and the Beauty Queen, <laughs> uh, which shot all over. It shot in the quarry in Illinois and down in Ironton. And hmm. it was a crazy, a crazy time. And I just, when it was done, I was like, well, I'm gonna move to LA. So I just packed up everything I could fit in my pickup truck and uh, drove out there. Um, I got into the union in 2012. I did a lot of uh, reality TV before that, uh, which was okay, but uh, union works a lot better. And then um, uh, I try to get on movies, but I don't get big movies very often. Um, and there's the sort of catch 22 of you don't have big movies and they don't want to put you on big movies. Same thing with commercials, same thing with TV. And so I just got in doing commercials and TV and then commercials fell off. And so now I do a lot of television art direction. Um, and I'm also a hay farmer occasionally. So that's, that's about it. I just finished up uh, Queen of the South in New Orleans, which was interesting because it was kind of a bifurcated season because of the coronavirus um and then uh in, in a couple of weeks i'll head back to la and try to land something in may 
So that's where we are. Okay, so with um, with like the art directing stuff, like with the reality TV, um, how how does art directing with the reality TV, how does that like go together? Well, art directing and reality TV tended to be a lot more construction coordinating, really. Um, I've designed reality and I've art directed reality. And the only real difference is a uh, production designer is really just a, um, a title. Everyone, you know, you're an art director and they give you the, you're the boss and, you know, you're picking colors and deciding what the carpet looks like. Um, and then an art director who's working with a production designer, typically you both have the title art director on your paycheck. Um, but then the art director is really just putting, you know, letting the designer come up with a vision and the art director is putting it into motion. On reality TV, you're really just, the art director kind of is the construction coordinator a lot of times, not always, but it's a, it's a lot, uh, um, there's some bigger shows like, uh, it's been a while, but like The Biggest Loser, they kind of had a more traditional art department, but shows that I did that traveled a lot, like uh, Cake Boss and uh, Tabitha's Salon Takeover, that kind of stuff. It's, you show up in a town, you try to hire the cheapest plumber, you know, and really you just end up being a contractor for the TV show. So it, it really, on Celebrity Fit Club, we did a whole, we actually built out a whole boot camp with an optical course and all that. So it really varied back then. Um, nowadays, the budgets have gone down for reality. So there's a couple big budgets and a lot of, they're mostly union in LA. And then there's a bunch of MTV, uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't know what they do. They like do the one with the Tinder that they swipe left. It's, it's like called hit or miss or something stuff like that like they used to have the whatever off the bus so it's really just a camera some writers and that's it um and, and then in regular tv it's much more structured so union tv is very uh, the art director again you have a designer and an art director uh on most shows and uh, it's very much project management um it's very much get it done, you know, and depending on your working relationship with the designer, you know, like I might be picking colors, I might be designing a room uh, only because the workload gets big enough that we just have to keep moving. Um, and then I'm coordinating with construction with our, our set designers who are drawing the drawings and so I'm making sure the plans are getting to where they need to go. I'm making sure the designers picking the colors that they need to pick. Um, uh, you know, getting getting all the prep work done on location, making sure everybody knows what's happening. You know, making sure the decorator tells the gaffer where the table is going to be at the house that we're going to, so they can put the lights in the right place. Uh, making sure the the drapes are the right color for the DP. Um, I'm, I'm part of those conversations a lot of the time, mostly just to say, hey, did you talk to the DP about the drapes you're using? Because some DPs that, oh, I can't have white shears. I need tan shears everywhere, you know? Other DPs, they want only blinds, you know, I, only blinds throughout the whole show. <laughs> And so you're, you're always having those conversations about, is this the look that we want? Is this what the designer really wants? And then of course the director, if the director's any good, they're gonna weigh in and make sure that there's a vision early on so that we're not wasting our time on something they don't want. So with, with scripts, whenever, whenever you get the script and you're looking and you're looking at them, what are you picking out in the script I mean, I understand like the, you know, the overall, hey, this is kind of the general concept of what we want. What do you really look at whenever you go into set design? Uh, so initially, uh, uh, as an art director, I'll do a breakdown. Some designers do their own breakdown. Uh, and the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna look at page count. 
Um, you know, it, it really, there, there, uh, it is very project dependent. Let's say that a, a feature is going to break. I might be doing kind of the same stuff, but I might approach it slightly differently for a feature as opposed to uh, a 10 episode series. Uh, on a feature, I have the whole vision in front of me. On a 10 episode series, we might not have all the scripts right away. Yeah. Um, or we might have all 10. So that kind of will affect things. But basically, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what's our page count? What is a permanent set? What are we going to spend most of our money on? Uh, what's our hero set that the character always comes back to? So in New Girl, it's the apartment. And it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's the bar and it's Charlie's house. Uh, you know, in New Girl, it was the law office. You know, so those become our permanent sets. And that's where we're going to spend a lot of money because we're going to spend 50, 40% of the show there, right? Yeah. Uh, and you you grow to understand that. And then after the permanent sets, you become to understand what are important sets by doing a page count. And you can just look. And pretty quickly, once you've done your breakdown of, of a, a script, you start to see a page count. Like there'll be something that's six or eight pages of a script scattered throughout uh, an episode. And you start to realize that oh, we should probably prioritize some of our money on this set. Whereas the producer might, you know, the writer loves this one shot and the DP's got a shot of whatever it is in this one old church, but it's gonna cost us half the budget just to shoot there. And you say, that's fine, we can go there and get this one shot but you could probably not spend any money there. Get the same shot because we're going to spend, you know, twenty five percent of the show in this other space. You know, if we spend all our money over on this cool light coming through the steeple bell, you know, whatever, uh, we might uh, miss a good opportunity to have a normal looking production because we're only going to see your shot for thirty seconds at most. So you get, you, that's your initial thing. Like, where do we want to spend money? And then the other part of the breakdown is, you know, in a script, you're going to have some highlighted elements, you know, in all caps. I'm looking for those all caps moments, whether it's a prop that's super important to the writer or uh, something else. I'm going to look at uh, what care, you know, how many characters are there? Like, are, are they doing a lot of things with props? So like I broke down CSI before I left and it looks like, they always have props and you start thinking, we're gonna need tables. We're gonna need, we have my, tables for microscopes and we're gonna need mm. carts to put things on. And you start having this conversation of, with the set, decora uh, set decorator about, you know, we, we're gonna have a room, this character reads a lot. So we definitely need bookshelves, but they're also examining evidence all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're going to need room for files. So our desk desk needs to be a little bigger than normal. Maybe we're going to have a lamp. You know, so you really start to think about those spaces based on how they're written. Um, and then finally, I might go through the script a third time and actually read the dialogue. I might read a script all the way through without breaking it down and then break it down. And then maybe I'll go back through and make sure I understand the dialogue a little bit there's usually not a ton of info there, but sometimes in the dialogue, there'll be a reference to some something. And it, it won't be called out in the script and nobody's really thinking about it, but you know, something about, you know, I don't I don't know what the line would be. Maybe one character says to another, let's put it in, let's put it in first gear and go. So you're thinking, okay, we need a manual car. So I gotta call picture cars, I got to say, look, we're looking for cars for these two guys to drive around in. They, we need a five-speed, no automatic, maybe. And let's put those cars in front of the director and see what we can find. So I'm also looking for clues like that. Well, well what's, what's something that um, writers do that just drive you batshit? Um, rewrites? Rewrites, OK. okay. <laughs> Probably, I would. That's the most front, you know. But a lot of times, that doesn't really come from a writer on a TV show. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the show. I for everything I say as usual, there's always going to be an exception. Um, but 
you know, sometimes the director will come in and just say, none of these locations work. I hate this scene. There's too much shoe leather. And the director really is driving the rewrite. So it's not really the writer doing it. Sometimes the writer's just solving the problem after the director complains about it. Um, but the, those rewrites, you know, you've been prepping for three weeks and you're down to your last week and all of a sudden there's a complete 180 in what we're doing. Uh, that can be troublesome, especially if you don't have a, a line producer who's going to say, no, we've spent our money, you know. So you go to the line producer and say, hey, we're, they're asking for all these changes. It's going to cost 50 grand. You know, tell me what to do. Because at that point, I don't want any responsibility for saying yes. Hmm. You know, I want the producer to say, I'm going to write the checks. Don't worry about it. Because in that last minute, that last week of prep, it's going to be overtime, extra guys, whatever it is to get the job done. Um, so the more time you have to prep, the less money you spend. And when there's a big rewrite, it costs money. Um, what was How that, often does a situation like that happen? One, one second. <laughs> so I was using headphones thinking it would cut out some of my back feed, but how often does a situation like that happen? Um, it depends on the show. Again, uh, you know, in Queen of the South, uh, it happened like every three or four episodes. Hmm. A director would come, you know, because the... So it was like a few times uh, on season five. So every episode they have a different director and you know some directors are really good at just getting it done and other directors are very fussy. And you know you just kind of roll with it. And the director can do all kinds of stuff and they can stomp their feet. But if the producer doesn't sign off on it you almost don't even worry about it. Um, on, it's, on Sunny, it wasn't too often. They were pretty sure about what they wanted, but they would rewrite on the day. They would be shooting the show and they would cut and turn to each other and just rewrite. And they did, there was no expectation that they would have anything done. They just dealt with it. And it was all usually dialogue, you know? They like, I, this is kind of funny. I'm feeling it now. Now that we're in the room, can we make it funnier? And that was just all dialogue and it never affected me. And sometimes the only way I knew about it was because I watched the show later. I was like, oh, that was different. <laughs> Nathan, can I just ask, because um, we're, uh, at least Ann and I are like, we're beginners at creating a movie. You know, we just created a script that we, that is, is just, uh, it seems to be really promising. So we're going to be relying on you, to sort of tell us <laughs> what would work and what doesn't work and rely on you for some leadership in helping us guide that and because we're not like industry people mm -hmm. um do, how, what's your comfort level in taking on that kind of role does that excite you that it's sort of like a startup project as a that... production designer yeah uh, as a production designer, sometimes that's super exciting. You know, if I had four kids and college payments, I wouldn't even touch it with a 10 foot pole hmm. because it's a lot of work without a lot of pay. So I think you're going to run into stuff like that. Um, if it's a passion project, it has a lot of heart to it. Um, I think you're going to find somebody who's going to be really passionate about it with you. And they're going to, you know, they're going to put what they can into it. Um, I think when you're approaching a project, you know, if you're talking about budgeting or solving the problem of telling the story, um, your best bet as far as getting it done is usually just lowering the cost of the project. Um, and that means not going a lot of places or doing, uh, you know, some of that more run and gun stuff. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not Amanda Pascal. What is, no. what is your name, sir? Uh, it's Anthony Pascal. Anthony Pascal. Yeah. Uh, Anthony was talking about earlier, you know, shooting in the park and getting people to involve themselves just on a whim sort of uh, kind of thing. 
So that, you know, if you have a project that can lend itself to stuff like that, that's great. But if you have a, you know, a sweeping masterpiece that has to be beautiful at every moment, um, you're going to have to, you will spend, you, you will want to spend more time up front figuring out every single moment and just having a really good plan and not deviating from that. So, and, um, and I assume an art director would be involved in those conversations and the planning of it. Yeah, there's a funny joke that's, uh, uh, how's it go? Well, the, the concept is, you know, the director loves you when, you, in, when you're the designer and they love you all the way up until the DP starts. And then they can't even remember your name. So like a lot of times when you're planning a project, it really helps to have a production designer come in and get the look that you're looking for in concept art. You know, once you have that concept art, you can show it to people and say, this is what we want. Um, that, is a, that is definitely a thing you should do. And we always, you know, whether it's in the union or anywhere else, we're always pushing for uh, the production designer to have that kind of role again. Because uh, right now we're fighting with a lot of, you know, Fox will start up a show, they'll have this idea, they'll send it to Korea, it gets illustrated and concepted and written, and then they'll fund it. And then, then they'll call a production designer and then they'll hand the production designer all the concept art and just say, make it look like this. Hmm. And at that point, you know, you've already lost, I mean, what's the point of having a production designer if you've already designed the show? I mean, there's obviously a point. The, the designer is going to come in and they're going to say, well, you know, this is a great idea, but I think we can make it better as they will. Um, but anytime you can employ uh, the people that are going to help you develop that look, you know, the, the sooner you can bring people in, I think you're going to be better off because you're going to have a better feel of it. Um, and that includes the DP. It, you know, a lot of times the look will come, you know, the DP, some DPs are really process oriented. They'll read and they'll, they'll look up all these images and they'll start coming up with, uh, they'll, they'll want to have a color palette for different characters mm. or maybe the, maybe your project is cold and distant in the beginning. And then by the end of it, something, you know, you have your revelatory moment for your main character and all of a sudden your post-process is much warmer, right? Or, well, yeah, one, uh, one of the things that we have to our advantage, I feel going in is last summer, I was able to, as we were developing the script, uh, go through and do some stock footage of the actual locations we would be using and filming. So, yeah. so uh, uh, I, and then I've condensed that into a six minute video and I've layered some of the key dialogue to kind of help paint the scene. Um, another asset that we have is our star. And uh, I originally wrote this part for myself, but then I started writing it for this guy, Bruce Scotia, who is uh, a big time uh, mobster movie looking guy, real handsome, like six foot tall muscles and stuff. So mm -hmm. I wrote the part of his cousin for myself. So we have us and we can certainly go to New England and film some sizzle mm -hmm. with Bruce. Uh, right, right. his gangster suit like like setting up the scene and stuff um so we have our you know like we have our one star and, and we can we can paint the picture do you think that brings us any closer to looking prepared at least as first-time filmmakers having these things um in our pocket well I, uh, well yeah i mean anytime you can prepare for the the process of making it putting a film together you've already shot the location and you kind of know what it looks like at four o'clock in April, you know, that's a big step. Um, it, you know, if you've already, if you've got footage of your characters doing their thing, that's gonna help your costume designer a lot. Cause maybe once they see some of that dialogue, they might say, oh, you know what? I think I know what kind of guy this is. He's not just a gangster. Maybe he's exactly, yeah. You know, I don't know. Well, everybody whatever, has, whatever everybody way it would have to be specific to your show, but right. 
But so anytime has many you layers, show people don't that. explore that. Right, right. Yeah. The other thing is, though, as filmmakers, once you start uh, bringing people's ideas in, it's going to change. You know, it's going to be people are going to have ways of looking at it that you haven't considered. And some of them you're going to like and some of them you're going to hate. And you're going to have to figure out, I think, how to decide what is going to work for your project, you know? Yeah. And I think we'll need a lot of visioning because it jumps back and forth in time. It's, it's both a horror movie and a gangster movie and a lot of nostalgia in it. And then Missouri is part is one of the characters in it. So there's like so many different angles coming into it. And well, and the thing about Missouri is it changes so much throughout the year, just like New England does. So you really have to think about what, what face of Missouri do you need to see because fall is so much different than spring. Uh, it, so as a character, you have to think about some, how are your locations going to uh, work in that en environment? Like where your character's always just getting another haircut, you know, um, and plastic surgery, and then changing it all back again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. you also have to anticipate, because I know Anthony's, um, what he's talking about isn't going to happen right away. You also have to anticipate the fact that literally, like, your locations might change um, as the businesses change um, sure. Sure. In, in the community. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, and that, you know, and, uh, that sort of low-budget film... Uh, genre is different too because in TV I would never talk to a writer almost never unless the, you know Crazy Ex-Girlfriend was different because one of our editors uh, he was an all right guy you know he was kind of kind of a, a goofy guy he was really outgoing and uh, we kind of wondered why he kept coming around and then he won an Emmy and they let him direct an episode he won an editing Emmy I think that's how it went. And then so then he was a director on an episode the next season. And uh, he was also involved with the writing because he was friends with uh, Rachel, who created the show. And she was a star and a writer on the show. And because they had so many roles in the show, we kind of end up talking to them. But that's, you know, that and Sunny, where the creators are the writers. And they're making final decisions as creators. That's the only time we really ever interface with writers on TV. A lot of times, just your regular staff writers are not even on the same lot. You know, they have these sort of like nondescript office buildings that they could be NSA or they could be entertainment <laughs> buildings. And there's just like floors of writers for different shows. Uh, you know, they have security and underground parking and you don't know, there's no signage out front. Uh, I, I've been to a few of those during uh, uh, early creative meetings, but after that, um, you never talk to them. So for you guys, you, you have the benefit of kind of, you are the producer, writer, director. So you're, you have the benefit of kind of being connected to the project and all of its steps. Uh, do you have an editor yet? No, we don't have an editor or a director of photography. Uh, I would, uh, you might want to start reaching out to editors. You know, because an editor, you know, maybe not right away, but before you start shooting, you might want to have an editor to talk to because they are they have a lot to say about the process that I'm not really keyed in on because I don't know what they do until the show comes out usually. Um, and again, they're on a, they're either working for an editing house somewhere else or they're remote somewhere. They're not there during production. Um, some shows have the, the, the editor, the main editor will send an assistant editor and they will edit uh, that night. They edit as they go, um, which is really powerful as a way to do things. So if you can involve an editor kind of early in the process, definitely before production and say, hey, you know, this is the look and this is where we're going. And uh, they can, they'll start to have ideas about how the pacing of the film. Um, 
And, and that editor, you might want to involve, the director might have an editor they like because they'll have a language with each other. Again, it's kind of above my pay grade, I think, but they'll sometimes an editor and a director have worked together before and they have this sort of way of communicating about, because uh, a director who's shooting a scene and they already have talked to the editor about how they think it's going to come together. And the editor's already expecting a certain thing from the director. It doesn't just streamline the process. A lot of times they, as it comes together, they go, wait a minute, we can do this a different way or wait a minute, I see the light. This could be this much better. Um, and it's not a surprise. It's more of a revelation during that process. Um, so I would encourage that, you know, you have your designer and then once the designers painted the room and put a couch in there, uh, it really comes down to the director and editor to get the show finished at that point. Um, so I, I would encourage that for sure as a part of that creative process. What's, what's something that um, me as a writer, what can I do to help kind of keep costs down on a production? Is there anything I can do in, with my writing to like streamline it? I mean, um, from what I'm getting, like minimize the amount of scene or the amount of locations obviously would be one of the things. Um, what, what else would you advise? Well, no one likes to hear it, but reduce the concept. Uh, don't make everything 1942 private eye. That's, that gets expensive and hard. To, it takes time to put that together. Um, you know, modern day, early future, that kind of stuff. Um, recent past. It, even now, the 90s, it feels like yesterday to me, but apparently that's a long time ago. That's yeah. historic now. Like when we go out, we try to find a TV that isn't a flat panel. It's a pain in the ass. Um, and so, you know, if you have something set in the 90s and you want to put it, a TV in the room and have it actually work on camera, that becomes a playback issue, a sourcing issue, it involves props, along with your playback footage that you're already doing. And you, you have to uh, get the TV rig to work with whatever camera or is, you know, if you're doing 24 or if you're doing 60 or whatever it is. Uh, with, so with the, the uh, TV, yeah, go ahead. With Sorry. the TV issue, what, couldn't they do like a CG overlay over the screen to minimize the whole making it work thing? Yep. I mean, that's a five minute job. Yep. Depends. If you're on a lock off, on a you know, establishing shot of the room and then you do a reverse and it's just flickering lights, that's cheap. If you have a handheld shaky cam with people walking in front of the TV, uh, it, as a producer, you need to price it out. You need to decide, am I gonna do this in post or am I gonna get it done in camera? In camera almost always looks better in the shaky cam environment, even today. Uh, but it, you know, to, technology gets better and better. There might be a future where it's just so plug and play, it's way cheaper to do it in post. Uh, but even today, you, as a producer, you still need to think about, you need to get price, you need to get pricing. It all comes down to money at the end of the day. This is all, it's, it is a business. Yeah. So if it costs more to, uh, you know, get your post guy on board and figure out, can I do these things in post? Uh, you know, it can cost six, eight thousand dollars to do ten seconds of video of just a TV burn-in. Kind of depending on how complicated the scene is, and then once you get up to ten thousand dollars, we can probably do it in camera for that price or a little bit less. But I don't know. In ten years, the, the stupid TVs are going to just be more and more rare, so we might have to manufacture them with like a. We we'll probably have to just build them and then fake it with a flat panel or something. Yeah. I don't know. And I'm, I just wanted to say from like Anthony's perspective, if you're going to make like a quarter of a million dollar movie, that's just a lot of that stuff is not an option because you just don't have a lot of options. Yeah. When your budget is low, well, you, you kind of need to say, look, you need to decide what is the most important thing to, to spend money on. You know, I think with $250,000, you're talking about a pretty small camera crew. 
Um, you want to have some control of the image. So you're, you're looking for, you know, a person or two people who are kind of involved with moving furniture around and helping, uh, you, you probably have a decorator designer at that point, someone who's just kind of controlling the environment the best that they can, um, when they can, and then try to find environments that just work for you. Uh, and then that way you're saving a lot of money there. You know, because by the time you have it, you set up a camera outside and put up a quarter grid, uh, you know, on a fly swatter, and you've already spent $12,000 for the day on a budget that's only a quarter of a million, that can be really serious. I think the trade off is that the less money you have to put into a project, the more passion and time you need to put into your your planning. Yeah, I, I always tell people like, um, because I've actually been on set for two films that I've written, which is a rare, rare thing. Uh, it it's, rare, one, rare. it's one of it's one of the benefits of working on a smaller film, because typically, a lot of people don't like to hear this, but you would get fired because they want to bring in someone else who isn't uh, as emotionally involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, as far as low budget stuff goes, it, I think you just need to say, look, there's tough decisions coming in. Just need to make them. And most projects, they work because of their dialogue. They work because the character goes through something everyone can identify with. People nowadays, they don't care if you have a, a phone movie because uh, they're used to seeing that that's what it's everywhere. It's all we did a we did a season of sketch comedy uh, with four comics, and yeah, yeah. most of what we shot and have is us rolling up in my Honda CRV, jumping out in a popular Philadelphia location, shooting our scene, and then splitting just gorilla, yeah. just gorilla filming it, and then piecing it together and editing. Um, and and I'm I'm proud of I'm proud of last season. Um, I, I'm I'm doing a rap video this season. Uh, the video's done. <laughs> We just had to do a retake of the song. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the track was distorted. So uh, I've done some editing and some like guerrilla filming and stuff. I'm just trying to picture, you know, obviously this project is so much larger than me doing a, a two minute content video just for some right. laughs. Um, but the, I think the decisions are kind of the same though. Right, right. It, it, it's just like on a more macro level. Yeah. Yeah. It, the reason we get away with it is because we do plan. I have a script and I have a production schedule and we rehearse and they see the product's production schedule. They know where we're going before we get in the car. So when yeah. everyone jumps out of the car, they're ready to get in character. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> But it was really, it was just like for me, an experiment and like uh, going to the next step with making a TV show or making a movie, mm -hmm. just getting my feet wet with being on this side of the camera because I had no experience before this season. Yeah, I, you almost, we need to find a producer for you guys to talk to because I'm kind of, you know, that's on the edge of my, like when, it, when you talk about procurement or sizzle reels, um, you know, it's rare that when I first moved to LA, I worked on all kinds of sizzle reels for Craigslist jobs for 50 bucks or for nothing. Um, but it's, uh, I think um, th there's definitely stuff there that I don't know that I, you know, I don't know what I don't know about that. You know, oh, well, he gave me two pages of shit I didn't know already today. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. I mean, just as a, I mean, everyone's been to the movies. Like for me, you know, I, I get, uh, hold on. I get, I, So I'm technically in the academy, so I, I get mailed every movie that gets made every year. And the thing that kills me about these is, um, like, they're always trying to tell me how pretty these movies are. But when you watch them, 
like Midnight Sky was great. It was super pretty. I know Jim Bissell, he designed it. It's a great film, but it's not really great because the spaceship was cool. Mm. It was really great because it was like kind of a heartstrings film that had a little twist. You know, I don't know. And then there's, let's see, what's a good one? You know, News of the World. It was really, it was a historic piece. It looks really great, but honestly, it's good because of the acting, you know, it's an interesting story. So, I mean, I'm a little jaded, I think, even as someone who does art department, you know, we do think about our sets as characters and we really try to build these environments that take it to the next level, but really it's kind of just starts with good dialogue. Honestly, and when I, I watch, I'm trying to, I haven't watched all of these yet. I'm trying to find one. Uh, which one? Oh, right. One Night in Miami. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a political piece. It's got a lot of power to it, but it's based on a stage play. And I didn't know that, but literally 10 minutes in, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this must have been a play because they have this, um, this way of shooting where everything happens in one room to the extent that you're like, this might've been a stage play because a lot of times a stage play only has two or three sets, if that, right? And uh, it looked fine. I like, oh, the period was great, but the subject matter just didn't grab me at all. The arguments that they're having, the political discussion, it, it's interesting, but as a journey goes, it didn't bring me in as a, a viewer. Uh, and at that point, I don't really care what the hotel room looked like. You know what I mean? So I, as a jaded art director, I think like the point is if your dialogue isn't any good, it, you know, it doesn't matter. And if your dialogue's amazing, it might not totally matter, you know? Right on. So, um, that, that's just one little caveat to, to all of it, maybe. <laughs> well, but also with, with what you do, you can have fantastic dialogue, great interactions, but if the rest of the world doesn't seem real, it, it pulls me out of that journey that I'm taking whenever I'm watching it. And oh, it, yeah, if, it, if it's so incongruent that it doesn't make sense, that is a problem. Yeah, yeah, Starbucks and Game of Thrones. I mean, come on. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, that is a serious <laughs> faux pas. Yeah, you know, if you're in a spaceship and you're supposed to land on planets, but you know, there's a Starbucks and ten forward on Star Trek. That's a problem, yeah. Yeah. right? That's not okay. Um, so I, there are some. I, 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 I will uh, concede that for sure. <laughs> But, but yeah, but talking like with, with the set being its own character, uh, like, a lot of, like a lot of my favorite shows, uh, well, like New Girl, I mean, The Loft, it's like, you, you, you know where everything's at. And that's mm -hmm. because it, it's, they've been consistent, consistent, consistent. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like you're walking into a friend's house. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we, we kind of treat them like characters too, because they go through changes. You know, the set season to season will change and then, some big thing might happen on the show halfway through a season and that affects how the rest of the season look will be. I'm trying to think of an example, but I can't. Um, uh, okay, so no examples are coming to mind, but you know, they might, some another character will show up or someone at, starts painting. I know oh, a new girl, she would start painting things. <laughs> So every now and then through the series, even if it wasn't really discussed or scripted, a wall would change color. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it would be di discussed, but she'd say, I'm repainting the house, but only one little wall would get touched. Yeah. You know, it was like, and it would kind of create this environment where it's kind of normal looking, but there's always something off. Yeah. So there was a, there was discussion about stuff like that. Um, you know, how, how do these environments really look? When, when, as she kind of descends into whatever weird madness she goes through. Uh, that kind of stuff is fun. That, I mean, that's, that's a reason to be in the business to do 
what you do. Everything else is kind of just busy work. What's, what's been one of your favorite productions that you've worked on so far? Favorite? Yeah. I know, <laughs> I, I know. It's, it's one of those bad questions to ask, but it's... No, uh, it's a, it depends on what... Uh, Sunny, I mean, I was a huge fan of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I met the designer for that and I just bugged him for two years and finally got on the show. Uh, I We did cool stuff on that show every season. There was always like, we, we drowned a set in a giant tank. We did a, we did a, um, this huge water slide thing uh, effect one season that was really cool. And then we would plan out months in advance and spend all of our money on that stuff. It was really cool. Um, but, uh, other shows, it's just when you work with a crew, that's just, you learn to appreciate crews that work really well together when you work on a show where everybody's toxic as hell. Yeah. So there is that aspect to it. And, uh, Sunny might not have been my favorite show in that respect. Um, probably actually, uh, just recently, um, Queen of the South, the last season of Queen mm -hmm. of the South, it was really, it, it worked well. I don't think it was amazing art direction. The, the, the show just doesn't lend itself to that. It's just not, that's not what it is. They don't spend a lot of money on sets. It's just really, it's much more perfunctory, you know, get to the car chase, do the shootout, find the cocaine or whatever it is they're doing. Uh, but the crew was great. Everybody was super cool. And I just enjoyed being there. So I don't know, just as a job, it depends. Well. What's what's a project that you'd love to work on, like an existing TV show, or if you could have worked on sci-fi? I've 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 been you know like I wrote Jim after I watched this. I was he didn't write me back. I'll see him at the Union Hall one of these days. I'll bug him. But um, like I love uh, sci-fi just personally, so I would I would really be much more in heaven working on a sci-fi project. I think um, I like westerns too. And I've been tangentially connected to some Westerns because uh, just I know people, you know, I did day play here and there on some different stuff. Uh, um, like Bone Tomahawk, I helped uh, make some props for Bone Tomahawk. Oh, outstanding. Yeah, that, that, film, that film is brilliant. <laughs> when we were doing it, I'm telling you right now, when we were doing that show, uh, I, I did a couple of days. I did nothing for that show. So it's, it's pretty meaningless. But when we were working on it, it was like, oh, this low budget movie to bone tomahawk <laughs> it was such a slog for the people working on it it was really tough but now mm. it's kind of a cult classic yeah um so it was pretty interesting um but yeah i think it, i would want to and not even star trek just like straight up um sci-fi features i think if i could move over somehow i would do that hmm. And I still have 20 years left on my career, so we'll get there. Oh, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, some people, you know, really get off on uh, period pieces. Like, they're just so into it. Um, I know I went to uh, one of the uh, industry talks uh, for The Great Gatsby. Mm. And uh, it was a few years ago, right? Um, yeah. They did, like, they did so much research for that movie all the dance numbers, every, every character that has a costume in that movie had some kind of costume backstory. Like they, wow. they immersed themselves in that movie. And that, that kind of stuff is really uh, interesting because it's just hugely creative and very, uh, it's very cool. I don't know how much of that translates to the screen. You know, if a character has a pretty red dress, does it really matter if, the pretty red dress was her grandma's and came from, <laughs> you know, whatever French Parisian dressmaker from the early teens, you know, I don't know. Uh, but when a, when an artist, when someone who's really into that really gets into it, uh, it seems like really good things come out of it in the end. I, I would As think a part so. of the process, maybe. Well, you, if, you, if you make an item or a prop costume, if you make it intimate to an actor or even to an extra, if, if they put their time in to really work with that material, because um, you, you see some movies where people are just obviously uncomfortable, literally in the clothes that they're wearing, 
So yeah. it's it, it, again, like that little stuff like that can pull people out of the experience. But yeah, yeah, and you you might not know why. You know, yeah. you know why is this scene not working? Sometimes it's, it is little stuff like that. Yeah, or, or somebody who's fidgeting with their hat or with the tie or the shirt all the time. I know I heard a story. Um, a grip I was on set with once. He was talking about was it Fincher, David Fincher. Or was it Lynch? He was one of those directors. He, I have never worked with those people, but he was like, oh, he was a dolly grip on one of these shows. I think it was Fincher. Anyway, they came, the, the director comes on set and, you know, it's beautiful, amazing set like you would expect. And he goes, it was a kitchen, I think. And he goes over to the cabinets and he opens them up and there's nothing in there. Right? It wasn't scripted. Okay. Like the, It's just background. Mm. He flips out and says, why, where's all the groceries, you know? So they had to stop what they were doing and go and fill up the cabinets with cereal boxes and all kinds of other stuff, just in case during the filmmaking process, somebody opened up one of the cabinets. Uh, and that's one of the things that's kind of stuck with me. We, we you try to think of these sets a little bit beyond what is scripted and you know, what the director's thinking you try in this job and part of the creativity is to think beyond that and say, are, you know, are we going to open the window and look outside and should we expect a breeze to come through the window, hmm. even though nobody's thinking about stuff like, you know, does the couch need to be super comfy? You know, is, is the actor, is the character, when they sit on this couch is part from part of the scene, and you're doing this amazing shot, you know, we can't just necessarily pick the couch for the color. It can't be a park bench. You know, when they sit down in it in character, it should feel like, you know, does it does it affect how we're, you know, doing this, uh, this scene, you know? Are they supposed to fall asleep on this couch? You know, stuff like that can come into play. Probably not so much on TV, but definitely on a you know, the low budget movies that I've, I've worked on, those discussions come up a lot hmm. because you spend so much time on a set. Whereas on TV, you know, again, it's, we get them done. But uh, on a feature, you really spend time thinking about the set and the set really does become much more of a, a creature that you're trying to glom together, you know, um, that it has a lot more life. Whereas on TV, you know, there's some of that, but also you have five more sets to work on. So let's, mm. uh, let's pick the paint and get, yeah. let's get going. Um, and, you know, maybe also part of the job is knowing when you need to think about those weird little details and not getting distracted by uh, pretty colors or uh, interesting plot points. Maybe it's not that big a deal. And that goes all the way back to breaking down your scripts and doing your page yeah. counts. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so there you go. I feel like I have a bunch of questions for all the writers in the room. You know, well, like, what do, do you, you have, have? You written anything? Oh, I write all the time, but I'm kind of dyslexic and I can't spell, and it's a <laughs> slog for me when I there's, write. There's an app for that. There's programs. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I use a. Uh, uh, there's that open source, like you just use script and text. Oh yeah. And, uh, and then you convert it into like, you know, I don't use final draft or anything like that. So. Yeah. I, I, I like Celtics or Celtix. It's I used to use that, but it seems like recently in the last year, it's gotten, it doesn't work on my phone for some reason. And so when I have a little note or I want to write a little scene, it's not doable. So I, I found, I just discovered in the last, like, Right before the pandemic, I discovered this other kind of uh, open source system of writing. So huh. I like that because then I'm just writing and then later I format. You can throw it all form. together. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? Bob book. Oh, yeah. Book. <laughs> well, I'm always making notes. I actually do a lot of just audio notes. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a weird scene pops into my head and I try to explain it. Like I'll just be driving to a location and go, oh, oh. Yeah. And I have like I have years and years of that, and I'll go through those, and that really is a nice process, as far as kind of just putting together an idea. Um, I have a hard time writing the end. You know? 
That's why I'm friends with John. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, what, what I would say, uh, if, you can, uh, if you can find this program, there, years ago, there was this program called Scriptware uh, that was made by a company called Cinovation. Um, and it is the best screenwriting program I've ever seen, although I haven't seen an update in a long time. Um, I sort of hate Final Draft, but yeah. if you're if you're a novice screenwriter and just coming into it, I suggest everyone buy that just for the sake of like learning format. But of course, if you're already in the industry in some other capacity, you tend to know those things anyway. This is called Scriptware. Uh, yeah, Scriptware. I they their website is still there, and I and I believe you can buy it. It's I think it's like. $199 or something like that. But it, I used to use it for everything. Um, and the writer who kind of got me into all this was a guy named Charlie Papura, who wrote the movie Satisfaction with Julia Roberts and Justine Bateman. Uh, mm. And he wrote um, Heaven Help Us with Andrew McCarthy. And he um, used to run the screenwriting program at NYU. And he swore by scriptware. And it's, it really is the best. Hmm. What, what makes it the best? Uh, just, you know, it's hard, it's hard to fuck up. It's really an easy program to learn, um, which is why I think he gave it to a lot of his students. But I, I kind of swear by it, too. It's a real time saver in a way that I don't know, for whatever reason, other programs don't seem to be for me. Hmm. You know, on CSI, I just uh, got this new, I haven't seen this a lot. It looks like a computer generated breakdown of the script where it literally counts uh, all of the mentioned locations as slug lines. Oh, and wow. It nice. tells you how many times they show up. Uh, so we were uh, without, so I only had the first script and I'm not on the show anymore, but they have, they've already written all 10 episodes. And so they were issuing this slug line version just to tell us what was happening during the season without having to read all the episodes. Wow, that's, and then so I, I don't know what, I don't know what program that is. That might be that final draft or uh, what's the other one, uh, Movie Magic? Maybe yeah, they use that. that. Yeah, fi final draft does, does a bit of that too. Yeah. Well, anyway, that was super helpful. So I, I don't know if you've got a 10 episode so it's show you're trying to put together. Don't be afraid of generating information. That's always, yeah. those, those shows can get uh, confusing and busy fast, so. So do you like getting the pitch material for like new shows, like a series, like the, like the Bible to kind of go through and like look at like the different, not, not necessarily just the locations, but also the, the characters. Like, you know, this guy, as far as like set design, you know, hey, this is his favorite mug. Okay, so we have to make sure that this mug is in the scene somewhere at any time. Uh, yeah, so stuff like that is always helpful just because now I don't have to think about it. It's I've been told, make sure that this mug exists. We probably should have three just in case and whatever else as a part of the job. I prefer the first season. I don't. I don't want to do your pilot necessarily. I mean, I do. That's fun. But I like the shows where the pilot's already sold, and either we're shooting the first episode pilot as the first episode of a ten episode run, or we're picking it up at the second episode because that first season is when you figure stuff like that out. Yeah. And that's actually fun. It can be hairy. It's kind of stressful sometimes. The first season can be hard um, for other reasons. But creatively, that first season is where you decide. You know, that's when you get to decide. You know, what does the apartment look like? What is the, where does their job look like? You know, how, how, you know, you get to have way more discussions with the DP about stuff. When you come in on the third season, they're just like, just watch the first two seasons, please, and make sure it looks kind of the same which is its own challenge, but it's not the same. It's not as fun. So I prefer the first season run of any show just for that reason. And then I like the second and third season just so I can pay my mortgage. So. There was one funny uh, thing. That it was a great device and it, it didn't make sense to me until you just mentioned it now. At the end of every season of Leverage, they would be forced to demolish their hideout 
so that the next season they would be in a different city with a different hideout. Oh, yeah, there you go. And it it didn't make it didn't seem plot important to me, but it was more probably stage important. Yeah, they might have they might not have been had the money to store the sets, uh, or you know I don't know. That kind of seems like that we rebuild stuff a lot. Sometimes sets just especially like on Sunny, you know, it was by season thirteen. It was we were rebuilding sets because they were just yeah. so old I, i've um, been on svu several times and that is a permanent set yes <laughs> the courtroom yeah. the the, the Never entertainment moves. center the the uh the office where all the uh, detectives work it's all there all the time looks exactly the same so for those shows that used to be the 22 or 24 episode you know 11 months out of the year shows they are permanent sets they never come down. With Sunny, when it's a 10 episode show, or uh, um, New Girl was permanent, but Sunny, we had permanent sets, but we would have to take them down and store them because they were only up for three months. Oh, okay. They wouldn't pay. It was stage 17 at Fox. They would never pay to keep it. They, uh, they paid a couple of years, and one year we went to Radford, you know, and, you know, we moved around a lot. Um, and then on, uh, uh crazy x it was permanent sets again because we were at some little schlubby side stage and they could afford to just keep the set it was cheaper just to keep the stage for three years um, yeah uh on on the tv show spec where you know we're, we're using my apartment as the permanent set and the, and the main location for the center yeah. of activity um so as long as i can renew my lease or if we get picked up <laughs> we'll have a We'll shoot the same shit in a brand new place. <laughs> yes, you go to a stage because you'll you'll enjoy the process much yeah. much more. Yeah, for sure. How okay? How much have you constructed like at your house to like take to areas? Have you done any construction there? Where is it all? Yeah, been? Uh, uh, I did a Fox promo. Uh, time is such a thing to me. I don't know how long it was a while ago and i had to build parts of the there was just like no money and we needed it on monday so i just went home and i fired up all my tools and i knocked out a bunch of flats once um but as far as you know prepping sets in the garage that does not happen very much yeah uh you know for youtube shorts or for spec stuff i think it happens a lot but um it's not comfortable unless you have a shop set up. I think in here, you know, I have a barn. I could easily turn that into a shop and probably be really happy knocking out sets. Honestly, if I could just stay here year round and build flats for people, I might consider a change of venue. <laughs> but there aren't a lot of uh, requests for flats in Bell, Missouri. So yeah, which is, and and again, it still blows my mind uh, about Bell. Because, well, we have, well, you doing what you do and, you know, living in the area, uh, all the work that John's done, like yeah. in Hollywood and stuff. And then we have another friend that uh, he grew up in Bell and he, he was on Dexter for like two seasons and mm -hmm. a couple of other uh, shows and stuff. But it's, it's weird for like per capita, it's like this is where everybody from Hollywood's coming from. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> And what's weird, you know, when I first moved to LA, I met a ton of people from St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, all of them are gone. Every last one of them moved away. Some of them are still in the business, but nobody that, or that I met. Uh, and I don't really meet new people anymore. I guess I'm too old or I, don't know, I work a lot. Or when I'm not in L when I'm not working, I'm here anyway. But, um, you know, you know, just always trying to network, meeting people, going to Hollywood parties. Uh, I met like 20 or 30 people from St. Louis. You know, one of the actors, different art department people, DPs. Um, a lot of them moved away, though. It was really interesting. I think, it, I don't know, it, it, LA is just such a crummy place to live, I think, if you were so used to. Uh, it, it's, it's different, maybe. I don't know. But I can see why people would come back and just end up in Bell or, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is a weird area. Well, like, like Tony there, you know, he loves Bell. And yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I said to Elaine, let's go to Bell, Missouri for a long weekend. And, uh, and 
read the movie. She's so like, yeah, sure. Never heard of Dom the story, but sounds funny. <laughs> I think that was a pretty place. There's a lot of pretty towns if you drive around central Missouri. Uh, I, I don't know why more people don't shoot kind of the Midwest like this. I don't know. Like the, this part of the Ozarks is kind of not as hilly. It's really, you can see these really interesting valleys all the time and really picture that you might consider postcard barns and stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised there isn't more love for the Midwest in filmmaking. I, I really think the weather plays a huge part in that. Uh, yeah, maybe. But and we shoot all kinds of shit in uh, New Orleans now. Yes, and the weather's true. just a huge pain in the ass. We had, yeah. we had hurricanes come through and tell us to stop. We had uh, just random rainstorms just totally destroy our outside. We, had, we shot uh, this whole thing in a uh, uh, sort of like a marine way station for metal. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Um, and it just got so muddy, they couldn't shoot. We had to flip the whole script for a week, you know, then wow. had to hold it over. And so they're, they're willing to tolerate a lot of weather. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if in downtown St. Louis and Kansas City have really cool urban looks to them. And, and I think when you go around the country, you notice there's a lot of cool places to shoot. So I, there's some other motivation because now they're shooting um a thing about hurricane katrina i just found out from a production designer the production designer i met when i first started it's always sunny in philadelphia he lives in toronto now and they're shooting a movie about new orleans <clears throat> and the hospital there in toronto and they're going to try to come to new orleans just to shoot a couple exteriors for a couple weeks before hurricane season starts but the whole thing's going to be in Toronto. So they're going to shoot Toronto as New Orleans, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, we'll that's, that works out. That's, that's pretty crazy. It's like uh, that show Ozark is actually shot in Georgia, but that matches up much better than uh, Toronto and New Orleans. Yeah, no, when I heard that, I said, really? He goes, yeah, we're going to. Yeah, it's a lot of stage work. A lot of the interior hospital is going to be there, I think. So a bulk of the work is there, it sounds like. And it's a lot of drama inside the hospital. So maybe that's how they're getting away with it. But he says they're doing some exteriors in Toronto. So they're. Must... I just think it looks to be like a close up of the side of a building as somebody walks by. You know, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to sell it. <laughs> but. I, I, I don't want to capitalize like on all the questions here, but just what what was one of the more fun and creative scenes or sets that you that you built or designed? No, oh, definitely, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Season season ten, I think. The gang goes to hell, part one and part two. We built the brig of a ship and then sank it in a tank. And so like as the, the gang maybe dies, you don't know. And the whole set fills with water as the ship sinks. Well, we had to build an entirely, just, it was a whole project. It was the coolest thing I had done up to that point, I felt like. And it wasn't so big that, you know, it wasn't like this huge feature where there were 3 million people working on it. It was a TV crew, uh, you know, I was pretty, heavily involved in the entire process as the art director, you know, from design all the way to when they sank it that day. So that did, was really- Did you do the, um, the Christmas special when Danny DeVito was birthed through the uh, sofa? That was hilarious. <laughs> that was, that was I, think that's the, I think that's season seven. So that would, that would have been the, the year before I started. I started in season eight. <laughs> but yes, that, that's phenomenal. Uh, what, are the, what, what, what was it season six or seven when they do the dance off? They want to prove to everyone at the uh, reunion that, and you know, Dee's got her like gear on and they're all just drunk as hell and they think they're doing this amazing dance, but they're just, just sad, awful slobs on the dance floor. <laughs> that show is phenomenal. It, it, I, I've always loved that show. Uh, Nathan, you said that I earlier that you had some questions for the writers? Yeah, I can't, you know, it's like, um, like when you're sitting down to write a movie, 
Like, what are you deciding to write about? Where does it come from? Is it just popping into your heads like it does on mine? Like my head just has ideas or are you functionally assembling a thing like I would build a set? Like, are you? Um, I, I'll, I'll speak to that. Like I start with just uh, like a one or two sentence log line uh, mm -hmm. conceptually. And I sort of go from there. And the first thing I do is try to strip it down as far as I can and try to write a script that is as co cost effective as possible. Um, you know, it, a lot of times I'll like, I don't always write a beat sheet now, but it's a good idea. And I recommend. Uh, What's a beat sheet? A beat sheet is, if you're taking a screenwriting class, a beat sheet is basically, basically all of your scenes scripted out to where you can almost like, it's almost having like all of the exposition done before you even get started. So all you're really filling in is the dialogue primarily, mm. which saves you a lot of time. Um, Cause I, if, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I used to primarily make my living doing rewrites, but ironically, I hate doing them myself on my own projects and that <laughs> helps prevent that. So you, you basically work out all the action and everything yes. through a beat sheet. And then you're basically, once you fill in the dialogue, you have a script at that point? Yeah, a beat sheet for feature film is generally about, I don't know, about 40 pages. And the, yeah, and then you're just filling in from there. So John had explained this process to me as we were developing the warehouse. And um, I am, an organic dialogue writer. So I'll just, I'll go with a scene and I'll have five pages and then I'll get stuck. This was very helpful getting me back on track. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know where the dialogue was gonna go, I could at least sketch out how the action would continue. And then that mm -hmm. was important when you're sewing plot lines and foreshadowing back in. This dialogue was more my forte. Uh, my, my plot structure has obviously gotten better when I wrote my first movie, but this was my first movie. Oh, okay. I, I mean, the mistake that I think a lot of writers that don't have a lot of experience make is that they, a, lo a lot of writers approach it too much like a stage play. And by that, I mean, like, they're just way too much dialogue. Um, mm. And they, it's a lot like what Anthony's talked about, like people don't teach you the other aspects of screenwriting and they think dialogue is everything, but it's really, when you work, when you do something like a beat sheet, it teaches you to be a little bit more spare, which I would recommend to anyone. I like that. I, I hate excessive dialogue. I, I don't know, I'm not good at listening to people talk sometimes. <laughs> what, I, I, uh, in, I mean, if I wanna go to the, if I wanna go to the theater, I'll go to the theater, which I love. Hmm. Um, but if you're writing a film, yeah, I'd rather not have that be the case unless you happen to be David Mamet and then I'll listen to you. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I do not. I've almost, if you put down, you know, 10 movies in front of me and three of them were secretly stage plays initially, I can almost always spot them. I, there's something about the way that writing goes that it's amazing on stage. I don't want to see it in the movie theater somehow. Hmm. All right, let me ask this. Uh, is foreshadowing dead? Tony, you had said something about foreshadowing. I feel like I don't see as much foreshadowing employed in a way that isn't ham-fisted. Well, without, yeah. without throwing the plot away, I think the, the, the reason it works in our movie is because we... Uh, we we give you a softball plot twist and then we hit you over the head with a harder one later. So uh -huh. like when Ed read when Ed read the movie, he said, I saw this monster coming. So I I bit into that and then I didn't see this other plot twist you had coming behind me. And that's what he really liked about the story. Was he's like, oh, this is a this is a this kind of horror movie. And then I was like, no, no, there's this whole other thing. Yeah. going on so um i don't know I, I think the reason it works in our movie is because we had a red herring yeah i 
I wonder, uh, I, I just don't know that I see a lot of really well-employed foreshadowing. I was watching um, a critique of Tremors recently and in there they bring up how good the foreshadowing is in Tremors. It's like subtle, the tension builds throughout the thing. Uh, it, the, the guy who runs the, the, the Asian fellow that runs the little store, you know, they don't fix his refrigerator at the beginning of the movie. And when it breaks at the end or near the middle, and it causes the, one of the uh, creatures to come up and eat the man, you know, it's like that sort of like really creative foreshadowing. I, you see a lot of that, uh, what was it? Is it Raising Arizona? Uh, you know, like foreshadowing the intentions of a character. So when that guy comes into town and he shoots the lizard off the rock. Yeah. You know, it's not just a cool like trick shot. It actually is sort of like a character foreshadowing, which it's, it's sort of like a symbology. I don't know that you see as much anymore. Am I wrong or? Um, you don't see it done well a lot. I uh, when I was in college, I studied under a professor that used to produce TV movies. And um, we worked on like uh, creating paradigms for screenplays. And she used to say that every character in your story um, has or should have a, uh, a through line. Like even if it's like waiter number three. So sort of like with foreshadowing, I see that like, you should like be able to pay off each of those little things, no matter how small they are. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, if it's done well, um, I just don't see it done well a lot. And maybe that's it. I don't know. I, I, I think I think something that happened was uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of foreshadowing. Um, whenever the Sixth Sense came out, suddenly it was all about the twist, and everybody wanted to write a twist. So right. instead of so instead of focusing on some, I hate to use the word the term tried and true methods of like hey you know this is going to be important later this is going to be important later, people started focusing on I'm going to give you all this information but it doesn't matter for shit because this is the real story. Oh, until the twist happens and then you go oh my god yeah now it all makes uh, sense uh, as. As the writer, you're going to have to be careful about the twists anyway, because if you deliver a false promise, your viewer yeah. is going to be unhappy at the end. So right. you want to be careful with how you do this without leading up to the points. Yeah. Uh, and I that's what I think shit should... about movies or TV. I'm just. <laughs> yeah. I agree Before... with you, Levi. I think the most annoying thing about The Sopranos was undeveloped plot lines. They would, they would, they would. Think you'd think they were going to explore something. They'd set it all up like uh, that big pussy's gay and then leave it. You know, they would never come back to it. Like, well, why did you, is, am I watching a soap opera? Do we, why didn't you just get to the point with the, why'd you show this to me? It didn't, it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. I, I just recently, um, getting some back some feed there but you know i just recently re binge watched every episode of um how i met your mother and um oh. that's that show like i never thought much of that show when it was originally on but it is so so brilliant they pay off so many tiny tiny things throughout nine seasons and if you actually have seen everything you'll catch things that go back years and it's it's wonderful um and, uh, you know, I, I love that in a movie. Ed and I were just talking about Promising Young Woman, who uh, that film is just mm -hmm. so, so good. Yeah. Yeah, there's I, there's probably some good payoff. There, there is in that. It's like when she goes, I mean, even if, I, I don't know, I, I, I see some discussion about how she, maybe it was too obvious, but maybe I'm old school because... I kind of like it just to be straightforward. You know, you know, here's the thing and here's the payoff because yep. I feel like that's just how I get to know the character better. When it's just always a twist, I'm always in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, one one of the best scripts to read like just as hard copy um I used to have one here on my desk at all times is the script for Chinatown because mm. 
it is not only straightforward, but it there are twists, but there are so many tiny little things and it improves with every viewing. And I've, I watched Promising Young Woman on Google Play, so I got to watch it several times and it, it got better um, with multiple viewings. And there were little mm -hmm. things that I missed at first that I caught later on and it made it a better film for me. Hmm. Well, now I'm going to watch it two more times and I think I have it over here. <coughs> well, I guess anything else? Edward, you had all the questions. You got any more? Well, <laughs> tons, tons of questions, uh, but uh, as, as far as what we're discussing here. Um, I, I would like to meet up with you sometime before you have to take off to LA, uh, at least by, uh, if you like Greek and you haven't been to the Greek restaurant here in Bell. Um, I'd oh, like no, to take I love, uh, Yeah, no, uh, I was actually disappointed. I drove through town yesterday and saw the dinner bell is closed again. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it was, it was under new ownership. And to be I honest, the, fo the food had gone to hell under the new ownership. Mm -hmm. So. I used to love sitting there with the dogs out. So that was my favorite dog porch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've eaten just about everywhere now in Bell. I'll be here for a couple of weeks. I'm actually going to town now if you want to meet in a little bit. I'm trying to see a man about my deer that I had processed, but that's another story. Oh. But um, uh, Wooly? Yes. <laughs> he he yeah. had some tragedy in the family. I'm going to see if I can get my deer back. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I feel bad for him, but uh, anyway, yeah, no, I'll be, I'll be around if you want to meet up, just hit me up and uh, yeah, I'll be around uh, for two more weeks. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, with, with your insight on a lot of this stuff, um, I can streamline more of my work because with, with me, it's like catching the attention of the producers to go, this product uh, will be, you know, equitable. I, I can make money off this and I'm not going to have to keep dumping money into it. So right. to, yeah, getting, getting like the locations cut back, uh, because as you were talking about that, I was thinking of like two scripts that I have right now that I know I can put, instead of having it in this location, I could have it in this other location that's already been there. We do it all the time. We'll be like, Hey, we have five locations here. You know, they're each coming in at 30 to 50 grand you know what if you did this this and this and one and these other shots in here and then we're done and there's a reason why new girl always is in the apartment and there's because it it's an amortized uh, so permanent sets are amortized they consider like each episode they take a little bit of that and say every episode gets so much money and so yeah. those sets have more money to spend but they use them as much as possible so when you have those nice locations where the gang all gets together or you're going to end up every episode that always helps because a producer will immediately recognize there's a really great amortized set for us you know and it they're there a lot so we'll be able to get a lot of uh production value out of it you know and, and anyway, really this was great thanks for the writing yeah. tips oh well and again thanks thanks for the insight uh you really I really don't think you understand just how helpful this has been uh, to me and I know to uh, Anthony and John. Absolutely. Great. I'm glad I could help. I don't know, but I'm glad. Whereas, yeah, thank Ed, you for I'm, doing this. Ed, I'm yeah. currently writing a script script set in the 90s, which, uh, <laughs> gave me, uh, yeah, which gave me something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah watch, it's watch about what be careful with those goddamn burn-ins you know on the plus side there aren't any cell phones because we always have to worry about the screen of the cell phone now yeah huh. so there's just it's all push button cell phones and pagers so that's good huh yeah and <laughs> well mentioning it like the 90s was you know 30 years ago i was like no it wasn't don't <laughs> shit yes it was so. but, yep <laughs> My best, my best friend in high school had a pager, and I, I was always like, "What are you a fucking doctor?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a drug dealer. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and off topic, you were a you were a PI. Yeah, for a couple of years. Uh, my mom uh, is a lawyer. She's a family lawyer. Okay. And she started like so. You would she would give her you know, documents to be served by a sheriff. Oh yeah. 
across the sheriff, they just drive by and they knock and then they leave. Oh, yeah. And so then you have to hire somebody to Personal process serve. server. <laughs> yeah. So I started just doing um, divorce paperwork, but it quickly grew into videography, surveillance, and oh, yeah. like following people. I got to go to concerts and I thought I was the top of the world. I got paid like 60 bucks an hour to go to oh, yeah. Kiss Aerosmith one night just to get pictures of this lady cheating on a, with a guy. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun, but uh, I, for some reason, I thought movies would be more fun. Oh, I, I think you're right. I was, I was asking, I was a police officer for about 10 years. So I didn't know if like you had done any of that and like kind of segued in because you got tired of getting shot at. So. No, I was just a weirdo who wasn't afraid to go to those weird places. I think, I think nice. that's. <laughs> so um, I'll probably end up shooting you a text here within the next five yeah. or 10 minutes and we'll try to get something set up. Because I, I, right, I do cool. want to speak with you further if you. Yeah, let's have lunch. Let's, uh, let's do lunch, as they say out west. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. All right, thanks thank you. Thanks for the info, Nathan. All right. Bye. See you guys. All right. Well, I will talk to you guys later as well. Have a good one, John. I'll talk to you soon, man.